Excuse me. What would you find the big At the end of the lobby, to the right and to the left. You walk right into the Okay, thank you. and some of our favorite topics as well. It's an honor for me to introduce him today to you. Let me give you a brief uh, introduction on his back background, which is uh, certainly illustrious, uh, multi-dimensional, very rich. It's not fair to summarize it in a few minutes, but I want to give him the time to make the presentation, so I will minimize uh, the time that I'll spend to introduce him here. Professor Talat Said Alman is a professor of Turkish language, literature, and history of culture at New York University, NYU. He is spending the current academic year on leave from NYU at the University of Michigan, where he is on a Rockefeller Fellowship writing a book on political protest, social criticism, satire, and revolutionary ideas in Turkish poetry from the earliest times until the present. For, formerly, he was on the faculties of Columbia University, University of Pennsylvania, and Princeton University for many years. In 1971, Professor Halman became Turkey's first minister of culture. That was the first, he was the first person ever to hold the cabinet post, and he created the ministry. From 1980 to 82, he was his country's ambassador for cultural affairs, the first and still only person to have held this post. He also served as Turkey's deputy permanent representative at the United Nations. Professor Halman is a poet, dramatist, critic, historian of literature, translator, and columnist. He has published some 35 books. I thought I was politic with five books, but uh, certainly we have a, a different case here. Uh, his books have been published in English and uh, Turkish. His uh, books in English include two volumes of his own poems, Contemporary Turkish Literature, Modern Turkish Drama, Suleiman the Magnificent, Poet, Rumi and the Ruling Dervishes, Living Turkish Poets, and three volumes on Yunus Emre, and many volumes featuring the work of prominent Turkish writers and poets. Among his books in Turkish are five collections of his original poems, a massive anthology on the poetry of ancient civilizations, books on ancient Egyptian poetry, and Eskimo poetry. That's, that's interesting. That's something I have not read yet. I look forward to doing it. His verse are translations of Shakespeare, complete sonnets, selected poems of uh, Wallace Stevens and Langston Hughes, and his one-man show about Shakespeare entitled Heroes and Clowns. His honors and awards are many. They include an honorary doctorate degree from uh, Istanbul's Bosporus University, Columbia University's Thornton Wilder Award, and Turkey's Best Play Translation Prize for his rendition of Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Count, and a title from Queen Elizabeth II, Knight Grand Cross, GEE, the most excellent order of the British Empire. So that gives you an idea as to his accomplishments, his qualifications. I consider him to be the greatest ever cultural ambassador Turkey has ever sent abroad. Certainly, we're glad to have him here in North America where he's serving this particular audience for many years, I must have with uh, great distinction. Uh, please welcome Professor Alman. Thank you. 
To see, to hear, to sense, to think and to talk, to run on and on, head full of care and carefree, to run. Hey, Taranta Babu, hey, how wonderful it is to be alive. Damn it all, I say, how lovely it is to live. Think of me as my arms clutch your broad hips that gave birth to three children. Think of the warmth, think of the stark sound of water dripping on a black rock. Think of the fruit you crave, its color, its flesh, its name. Think of that flavor in the eye, the crimson sun, pure green grass, and the moonlight that blooms like a huge blue flower. Think, Taranta Babu, the pomegranate that gives fruit once a year can yield fruit a thousand times. And the world is so huge, so lovely, its shores are so endless that every night we can all lie side by side on the gilded sand and listen to the song of the starry waters. What a lovely thing to be alive, Taranta Babu. Living is such a beautiful thing. To live as one divines a masterpiece, as one hears a song of love, as a child caught in wonder. This poem, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, is by Nazem Ikmet, the great 20th century Turkish poet. It is an, as you uh, heard, a sort of rhapsodical celebration of life and love, of the passionate, sensuous embrace of human and natural beauty. It is uh, from a book that consists of um, poetic letters that an imaginary Ethiopian sent to his wife from abroad. The wife's name was Taranta, which, which is repeated in the poem. And I, I think the poem captures the quintessence of the Turkish joy of life and that sense of love. And for that reason also, I'm grateful to the Michigan State University and to the Turkish Students Association and the International Business Development Center for sponsoring this talk. Of course, I'm deeply uh, indebted to my friend, Professor Tamer Cicavushkil, who is the guiding spirit of the Turkish community here and a very distinguished professor. <coughs> also to Ms. Gülseren Aygüler, uh, who spared no effort to organize this event, and to Mr. Kerim Ertan, who uh, has been very helpful, and Professor Bahadur Inuzu, uh, formerly of the University of Michigan, now uh, teaching in um, uh, Louisiana at New Orleans. And it's wonderful to be on this very beautiful campus. Uh, the University of Michigan, I understand, is occasionally referred to as the Harvard of the Midwest, and Michigan State University is, of course, the Yale of the Midwest. And uh, Lansing is a wonderful place. I understand it's a center for dancing and a Midwestern center of love. That is why it's a great delight to bring to you uh, talk about uh, love in Turkish arts. And I'll try not to make this an academic lecture, uh, not an explanation as such, but a sort of experience of Turkish love poetry and visual images of love in various Turkish arts. It will not be exhaustive. Those of you who might know Turkish culture and uh, Turkish literature will find that many of your favorite poems and even poets will not be included because uh, in Turkey there's been an industry of love and an industry of poetry. If I were to read love poems to you, it would take not two hours, not 24 hours, but I could go on until the year 2001 if I were to read them for 24 hours a day, nonstop. There's really an unbelievable uh, profusion, effusion of poetry in the Turkish experience. Turkish creativity is, if I may call it that, an art of the heart. Uh, and th th therefore, I'm grateful to all of you lovers of love poetry, all of you lovers of love for coming here this afternoon, although you could be outdoors enjoying the beautiful weather, to hear Turkish love lyrics and to catch glimpses of the love themes in some of our arts. Love, tender and passionate, often in the ecstasy and exuberance of mysticism, erotic or metaphysical, idyllic, idealized, or matter of fact, 
has been the most dominant theme of Turkish poetry since its outset about 15 centuries ago. And uh, as uh, the Latin saying goes, omnia vincit amor, love conquers all, has been the most enduring conqueror in Turkish history in all its forms and manifestations, in love for women, for men, for God, humanity, beauty, the homeland, love for peace and justice, and a humanitarian understanding, a spirit of brotherhood, love, and harmony among all nations. And the time-honored Turkish saying goes, Aşk insanı söyletir, love makes the human being articulate. If this is true, judging by the virtually inexhaustible outpouring of verse, Turks must have been in love all the time, generation after generation. Compliments have been paid to the Turks, particularly in the West, some backhanded compliments or wishful thinking, perhaps, for the Turkish sexual prowess. Uh, you might remember uh, that, that uh, very naughty Victorian novel called The Lustful Turk. And I'm sure everybody remembers uh, King Lear, in which um, Edgar, the madman, boasts that in woman he art paramour the Turk. Although, in a way, all this has bolstered our ego and reinforced our machismo, maybe the tribute was not really well deserved, judging by poetry again. Maybe those so-called great lovers were only frail, dreamy-eyed, romantic poets cavalierly singing their romantic songs, because the Turkish mentality is sentimentality. And much of it, of course, is expressed in poetry. Poetry has been our indelible destiny, our nomadic norm, our imperial imperative, and our modern mode. And I have a sort of uh, little piece of doggerel about the popularity of verse among the Turks. It goes as follows in an atrocious version with rhymes. For anyone worthy of the name Turk, poetry is a national quirk, almost a duty he cannot shirk. It erupts wherever emotions lurk. It enchants the postal clerk and the soda jerk. When he hears it, his passions perk. It can only please him, it cannot irk. It wipes off the tear and the smirk. For the Turk, poetry is even a lovely way to go berserk. <laughs> and th that experience starts back in the fourth, fifth, and mainly in the sixth century AD, when the Turks were still living in Central Asia, their original homeland. And in the 6th century AD, there was uh, the first poet whose name has come down to us. Uh, prior to him, there were anonymous poems, and some became available to us only in Chinese translation and not in the original Turkish. And there, a uh, prince by the name of Akrin Çortigin was writing some very beautiful love poems. Gods of light, grant me this bliss. Let my gentle darling and I Join our lives forever. Mighty angels, give us power so that my black-eyed sweetheart and I can live and love forever. The uh, themes of women, the place of women in nomadic society, and love themes uh, became very dominant in the Turkish national epic, which had already started evolving uh, around the year 1000 or so. And then it continued, it was handed down from generation to generation until finally it was transcribed in the 15th century. It's called The Tales of Dede Korkut, twice translated into English about 15 years ago as a Penguin edition and an edition published by the Texas Tech University Press. Uh, both very serviceable, uh, very lovely translations. And there, uh, one finds many exciting battle scenes and a struggle for survival in the case of these uh, nomadic uh, groups that are traveling. Twelve tales interrelated, but they form a sort of unity. However, they can be read separately as well. And there, one finds uh, the definition of the ideal woman as both homemaker and warrior. And I'm quoting directly from the published translation. She is the mainstay of the house, without whom the family collapses. Now, that's quite predictable, of course, but her husband expects a bit more from his wife in nomadic life. Again, quoting from the published translation. 
She must get up while I'm still in bed. She must mount her horse before I have mounted mine. And before I ride forth to fight the enemy, she must bring me their heads. And there's also a story in uh, that epic which is very charming. And according to tribal custom, even before uh, they were born, a prince by the name of Bamsubere and a princess by the name of Banu Chichek had been um, uh, betrothed to one another. An engagement had been concluded for them by their parents that they would, when they would grow up, get married. But when they were still infants, the two tribes uh, drifted apart. So the fiancés never laid eyes on each other for many years. Years later, the prince, now a dashing young man, is pursuing a herd of deer and suddenly comes upon the dearest of them all. He catches sight of Banu Chichek's, the princess's red tent in the distance and realizes from, from the flag hoisted on it that it is actually her tent. Finally, he is going to find and see and be together with his fiancée. As he approaches the tent, the uh, princess, Banu Chichek, sees him looking out of the tent. But of course, she doesn't know him from Adam. On his horse, Bamsuberek is a real macho figure, very impressive looking. But the princess isn't really impressed. She asks her maids, again I quote from the translation, who is this effeminate creature, the son of some cuckold, trying to show off his masculinity? When the prince introduces himself, she realizes who he is, because she knows the name, of course, as uh, her future husband. And she decides on the spur of the moment to put him through an arduous test. She says, I'm Banu Chichek's nurse. And she is not the sort of person who would show herself to you just because you two have been engaged by your parents years ago. She says, first, you must prove yourself to me as a man worthy of her. And first, they have a race on horseback, and the prince wins. Then they shoot arrows. The prince wins again. Thereupon, the princess says, young man, no one has ever been able to ride faster than I or shoot an arrow farther than I. She says, now we're going to wrestle. They dismount and grapple with each other like two champion wrestlers. It becomes a real battle of the sexes. The prince tries to knock her to the ground. She struggles to make him lose his balance and fall. And the prince is exhausted and he thinks to himself, because his men are on their own horseback or, or dismounted, uh, looking at this uh, uh, terrible test that uh, their prince is going through. And he says, if I get pinned by this girl, then my tribe will poke fun at me, and that will be the end of me. So he gathers his strength and grabs her by the breasts as she struggles to free herself. Then he takes her by her narrow waist and throws her down again, making her land flat on her back. Only then, Banu Chichek confesses. Young man, she says, I am your fiancé. Thereupon, the prince kisses her three times and bites her once. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Turkish oral tradition. <laughs> but once they have married, then it's romantic love, and uh, you know they address each other in the loveliest romantic and uh, uh, exotic terms. For instance, when the prince comes home after a long day's work at the hunt, a big game, etc. He enters the uh, tent, and this is the way he calls out to his wife. Will you come here, my love, the crown of my home, walking along so tall like a cypress tree, with that long black hair falling to your feet, with brows like a tightened bow, and a mouth too small for two almonds, cheeks red like the apples of autumn, my melon, my lady, my love. And this is the way she <coughs> addresses him. She says, come to me here, the crown of my head, the throne of my house, my kingly father's son-in-law, my lady my mother's apple of the eye, you who were given to me by my parents, you the first one I saw when I opened my eyes, the one I loved at first sight. Now, while this tradition was, was growing, uh, the earliest written works of Turkish literature were emerging. Uh, two 
uh, major works were written uh, around the year 1070 AD. And one of them is a sort of mirror for princes, a guide for the ruling establishment, written by a poet who was a <coughs> statesman himself, a chancellor of the state. And it's long written all in verse, 6,500 couplets, 13,000 lines of poetry. And it uh, gives advice about the principles of good government uh, and the principles of justice and uh, social service to the community, etc. And it has some wonderful passages. Uh, one of my favorites is about love and marriage, and uh, it's entitled How to Choose a Wife. I'll quote just briefly from uh, the uh, translation made by uh, Professor Rob Denkoff of the University of Chicago. Uh, it's touched up a little bit here and there, but it's a very fine translation. Uh, How to Choose a Wife from uh, Wisdom of Royal Glory by Yusuf Hashajib in the 11th century. Marry a virgin if you can, one who is untouched and who has seen no man's face but yours. Then she will love you, having no one but yourself, and she will not bring with her any unbecoming habits. Keep women indoors at all times. Do not let women mingle with men while eating and drinking, for once you do, they will go beyond the limit. And do not let women out of the house, for once they are out, they will lose the straight path. A woman is basically flesh, and flesh must be preserved. If it is not preserved, it begins to smell, and then there is no cure for it. So treat women with respect and give them what they ask for, but lock the door of your house and keep other men away. There's no constancy with these creatures. In the 11th century, uh, the Turks, who uh, had already moved in from Central Asia into Asia Minor, uh, started establishing their own major state called the Seljuk State, which is very often referred to as the Turkish Seljuk Empire. And it held sway until the latter part of the 13th century. And then, of course, that entire territory was taken over by another uh, state established by the Turks, the Ottoman state. Uh, but during that period, in the uh, Seljuk period, uh, a man was born in the Anatolian countryside uh, who came to be known as Yunus Emre. He was born in the year 1241, exactly 750 years ago. And uh, because he was a major poet who spoke the language of the people and who was able to write simple poems in lilting, authentic Turkish, which is still, to a very great extent, intelligible to uh, contemporary Turks. And uh, since he gave expression to very beautiful ideas and ideals of humanitarian values and humanism and the worth of the human being and um, harmony among nations and, and religions, uh, a great plea for peace and understanding among all human communities. Uh, UNESCO has recognized this and uh, at uh, the General Assembly of UNESCO in Paris in 1981, where I had the honor of representing Turkey, they passed a resolution uh, unanimously to proclaim 1991 as the International Yunus Emre Year in honor of this uh, very uh, early and very eloquent humanist who wrote lines like, for those who truly love God and his ways, all the people of the world are brothers and sisters. I'm not here on earth for strife. Love is the mission of my life. That sounds like make love, not war, of the 1960s, doesn't it? But he had made that statement at least 700 years earlier. We regard no one's religion as contrary to ours. True love is born when all faiths are united. He also wrote some wonderful hymns that were sung in the Anatolian countryside century after century by generations uh, that succeeded one another handing down this musical and poetic tradition. And uh, one of them is uh, a very, very uh, famous hymn that uh, many Turks know. Um, the rivers of paradise are flowing in the name of God Almighty. The nightingales of Islam have come out to sing in the name of God Almighty. 
Şol cennetin ırmakları Akar Allah deyü deyü And it goes like that, it's a, a haunting, mesmerizing melody. And in 1958, when uh, a monument was being unveiled to memorialize the, this great poet of uh, the rural uh, Turkey, in, uh, outside of the city of Eskishehir, where it is claimed that he's buried, I am saying claimed because there are 12 or 13 towns and villages in Anatolia that claim that this poet is actually buried there and said, passionate rivalry among those uh, 12 places to claim that he was actually buried there. Uh, but when uh, Eskishehir had the honor of uh, offering a monument, the government um, organized a simple ceremony where the governor of the province of Eskishehir and the mayor of the city and um, the education director of the city, etc., would give uh, one talk after another, and that would be the unveiling of the monument. But the people, peasants, simple townsfolk, village folk, heard about this. And they came in ox carts, they came on buses, they came by car, they came on foot, and 30,000 of them converged there. And as the uh, local officials were trying to give their speeches, the people were so enthusiastic about their own poet that they want to celebrate him them, themselves. And they broke into this hymn in unison. Imagine that, out in the open in the countryside, 30,000 people singing this hymn that I just sang for you. And the speeches were drowned out. There was no real official ceremony. The people celebrated their own poet themselves. And there is that sort of passion about Yunus Emre in Turkey now. And he wrote some of the most rhapsodical, most beautiful love, love poems. He said, Go and let it be known to all lovers, I am the man who gave his heart to love. I turn into a wild duck of passion, I am the one who takes the swiftest dive. From the waves of the sea I take water and offer it all the way to the skies. In adoration, like a cloud I soar, I am the one who flies to heavens above. And he always protected the, the rights and the status of the common people against local politicians and feudal lords and uh, uh, people who were being unfair to them, exploiting them. He wrote four lines fulminating against exploitation and injustice. Kindness of the lords ran its course. Each lord nowadays straddles a horse. They devour the flesh of the paupers and gulp down the poor man's blood. Those are very strong lines, and that is why the people of Anatolia love him too, not only for his love themes, but also for his having defended them for justice and for a better life here on earth. He was against the idea that uh, the schismatics of, of religion uh, kept perpetuating that, you know, you can suffer here, but uh, if you suffer enough, you'll gain entrance into paradise after death. No, Yunus Emre wanted them to lead the good life here on earth too, and stood against these uh, traditionalists in vehement terms. Better than a hundred pilgrimages is a single visit into the heart, he said. Whereas all the religious people, of course, of, of Islam were saying, you must go to Mecca and, and do the pilgrimage, etc. He said, no, a single visit into the heart is better than that. And although in the medieval Islam particularly, uh, the scholastics were, were saying, well, a human being is worthless, human being has been cast away from divinity, uh, is being punished here on earth, and, and therefore you have no worth, you can easily give up your life in the cause of war, etc. He was saying, no, no, he was saying, man is God. If you don't see man as God, he wrote, all your learning is useless. Mystic is what they call me. Hatred is my only enemy. I bear a grudge against none. To me, the whole wide world is one, he wrote. I, th I think Saddam Hussein should have heard those lines if he had any intelligence to understand the wisdom of all those statements. You better see God right in your own heart. He is neither in the Holy Land nor in Mecca. He wrote. And some of his love poems have become very famous uh, songs as well, like 
Aşkın aldı benden beni. Bana seni gerek seni. Ben yanarım dünü günü. Bana seni gerek seni. Your love has taken me away from me. You are the one I need. You are the one I crave. Day and night I burn in agony. You are the one I need. You are the one I crave. Aşkın aldı benden beni. Bana seni gerek seni. It's a lovely song like that. And uh, very soon, a very distinguished singer uh, will, will be giving a concert at the University of Michigan on April 6th, as a matter of fact. The entire concert will be devoted to the poems and hymns of this particular folk poet. Her name is Esin Afshar, and she'll be appearing on the 6th of April at the University of Michigan at Rackham Auditorium, I think. Uh, and the joy of life that Yunus Emre expressed. This world is a young bride dressed in bright and green. Look on and on, you cannot have enough of her. The man who feels the marvels of true love abandons his religion and nation. <clears throat> and listen to these four lines which are expressed in such perfect friendship and forbearance and forgiveness. If some people oppose me as my foes, may God become a loving friend of those. May each one come upon a rose garden and the spring season wherever he goes. Isn't that a lovely way of making up with enemies and even considering foes as your good friend and wishing well on them? That is related, of course, to the basic idea of Yunus Emre, which he summed up in, whoever has one drop of love possesses God's existence. The world is my true ration, its people are my nation. I have these eyes of mine to see your face. I only have hands to seek your embrace. Today I shall set my soul on the road so that I can, tomorrow I can reach your place. And he extended more than 700 years ago a very lovely quintessential invitation to all people for friendship and peace. Come. Let us all be friends for once. Let us make life easy on us. Let us be lovers and loved ones. The earth shall be left to no one. After the Ottoman state came into being, of course, all these poems were, were still the basic form of entertainment and enlightenment in the countryside. But in the major cities, particularly in uh, Istanbul, after the Turks uh, crushed Byzantium and captured the city of Constantinople and turned it into their imperial capital of Istanbul. Uh, a very strong, very beautiful type of classical elite poetry developed also, written by poets who were very close to the Ottoman court. And many of the sultans themselves were, were poets, actually. In fact, I'll be reading uh, quotations from some of their poems. Um, in the 16th century, that tradition of elite court-related poetry reached its zenith, <coughs> probably, at the time of Suleiman the Magnificent especially. And there was a, a poet uh, writing in uh, the Ottoman city of Baghdad by the name of Fuzuli, and he wrote some of the loveliest poems uh, for divine as well as human love. I wish I had a thousand lives in this broken heart of mine, so I could sacrifice myself to thee once with each one. I wish the torment you inflict will be boundless like your beauty, so the people of the world will find it painful to love you. He is also the poet who wrote the proverbial couplet which goes as follows, love is all there is in this world, science is nothing but idle talk. Uh, that's not an easy statement to make at a distinguished university like the Michigan State University. Uh, but th that was the supremacy of love for the romantic Ottomans, as poetry still seems to be very popular in today's Turkey. And there were, in that period already, uh, from the 13th century onwards, very distinguished women poets in that tradition, too. There was one called Mihri Hatun, 
who was writing in the 15th century. And she led a liberated life. You wouldn't easily imagine this in a conservative Islamic society like the Ottoman society. But in the 15th century, she was famous for the love affairs she had with some of the you know, top people of the Ottoman establishment, etc. And she was being challenged and criticized by the narrow-minded people of that time. And uh, this is the way she struck back at them both romantic and defiant. At one glance, I loved you with a thousand hearts. They can hold against me no sin except my love for you. Come to me, don't go away. Let the zealots think loving is sinful. Never mind, let me burn in the hellfire of that sin. She also poked fun at men who were in Ottoman times, unlike men in Turkey today, male chauvinists. She said, Far better to have one woman with class than a thousand males, all of them are crass. Now, from that tradition also emerged some wonderful poems about uh, love of pets, love of uh, cats, not so much dogs, because dogs, unfortunately, aren't really appreciated much in uh, Muslim countries, but cats are beloved, and the Prophet Muhammad also was very fond of cats. There's a story that one day he was praying, and while he was doing his, his prayers, uh, a cat came and uh, started uh, sleeping uh, right on the skirt of his mantle, the Prophet's mantle. And the Prophet got through praying and noticed that the cat was still asleep, and he said, uh, uh, signal scissors, and they brought scissors to him. And in order not to disturb the cat, he cut off the edge of his mantle, and that is the way he got up so that he wouldn't disturb the sleeping cat. So cats are, are really considered uh, very lovable. And there was a poet in the 16th century who wrote a whole long elegy to his favorite cat, who unfortunately died. And uh, I had translated it only partially. It's a fairly new translation. And I'll read it to you to show you how the Ottomans loved their pets. He is dead and gone. Alas, what shall I do? Pity, pussy. The flames of death devoured you, a calamity, pussy. The lion of doom tricked and mauled you, woe is me, pussy. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. That cat of mine was so playful, such a wonderful guy. He had a grand time catching the birds that fly in the sky. He'd eat anything he got, a roll, a patty, a pie. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. Sure, he caught sparrows just like that, but hens and geese as well. Great fighter, he even turned the lion's life into hell. Soldier of faith, he'd kill mice as though they were the infidel. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. Fearless like a lion, ferocious beast in combat. You think he was old? No, he was a young and sprightly cat. Every hair of his whiskers was a scimitar, that's that. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. No singing virtuoso could boast of a voice like his. Venus would lay her lute down when she heard his melodies. My cat despised all the sinners as well as the Sufis. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. How shrewd he was, a fox, and beyond his years, wisdom-wise. He'd take on the wolf, the tiger, and the other big guys, slinking like a cypress, had black brows, honey-colored eyes. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. I adored him with all my heart as my beloved, whom I would hold in my embrace every night in my bedroom. His tail made my whole house spick and span like a magic broom. Alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. Now let all the rats overrun the world, see if I care. Let them pierce the bags and eat into the sacks everywhere, making the poor shriek and turning the rich into poor. So there, alas, what shall I do now? Oh, pity, pretty pussy. So that was the spirit of the Ottomans. Both elegy and satire rolled into one in a poem, which has that sort of bird. But the Ottoman uh, love of life and vivacity uh, were also reflected in the shadow theater tradition, 
which started in the early part of the 16th century. Suleiman the Magnificent's father, Selim, uh, conquered North Africa and Egypt, Cairo, etc., and watched it uh, as performed for him by the great puppet master of, of Egypt of that time. And he decided that Suleiman, whom he considered an artistic type, might enjoy uh, this type of theater and brought the uh, puppet master, all their puppets and figures and everything else from uh, Cairo into Istanbul, a group of 60 people, the families of the puppeteers, etc., and it became the craze of the Ottoman state. And there, there of course, uh, uh, there's not much romantic love because it's all comedy, but the people are basically very friendly. Sometimes they fight, but they always make up, and th there's a sort of uh, equality of the different ethnic and religious communities of the Ottoman Empire, at least at the street level, uh, where if uh, a Muslim uh, insults a Jew, the Jew strikes back just as harshly, physically or verbally, or if an Albanian has a, has a fight with uh, an Armenian, they are equals. Everybody seems to share exactly the same life in lower class life in the Ottoman Empire. There are no heroic stories in that tradition. Uh, there are no romantic stories. It's all comedy like a series of, like say, cheers on American television. Uh, it's one episode after another, all in hilarity. And there are some you know, lo lovely people in there. For instance, uh, this beautiful lady. These are all made in, I don't know if you can see them well or not. Uh, this beautiful lady, look at that look at dress holding a flower and a barely visible veil. And all, all these, uh, of course, appear in shadows on a white screen. And then a 19th century westernized character known as Dandy. And of course, he, uh, in a swaggering fashion, chases these beautiful young ladies. And uh, there one finds the, uh, not only the hilarity, but, but also the joviality and the good humor of, of love themes. Uh, and uh, I don't have the principal characters here, but I want to show you these because these are younger and romantic characters that represent love. And of course, the eternal symbol of love, the flower that she's holding. These were made incidentally, personally, by the last great master of the puppet art. The art has been deteriorating in the past 25, 30 years or so. These are by Hayali Kuchukali, who was the last living master, both of puppet making as well as puppet performance. And uh, the entire uh, tradition uh, was kept alive until the modern times, particularly with the advent of, of television. Of course, it is uh, not dead, but uh, has suffered intensely, not only because television is a major rival for this, this sort of art, but because they started showing it very badly on TV, and everybody got awfully bored uh, because these puppets were not reflected well on the TV screen, and the small screen didn't do justice to them, and suddenly everybody was turned off, and unfortunately it's a dying art, unless it's done very well in public, in person, by a great puppeteer who can uh, manage to hold and manipulate as many as uh, seven or eight figures on the screen at any given moment. Sometimes, of course, there are fewer, uh, but as many as seven or eight at a time. And one person does all the voices, all the accents, and sings, and uh, he doesn't necessarily use a prepared script. He embellishes the basic script and adds to it, or, or makes comments depending upon what the audience is like, and also sometimes criticizes the, the government. And uh, the uh, tradition of folk poetry in the countryside uh, gave rise to a marvelous body of romantic love poems written by minstrels, by traveling uh, musicians who uh, either extemporized their poetry or recited them to the accompaniment of music, which they often uh, performed themselves, of course, uh, tomorrow night you'll be hearing uh, some of those authentic melodies there at a concert to be given by Mr. Esdemir Erdogan and his group. Uh, but th there's one poem which stands out as perhaps 
the most uh, beloved of the Turkish uh, tradition. It is uh, a poem written in the 17th century by a traveling poet named Karajopola, who was very famous in his time, and his tradition has also continued. And uh, he wrote, wrote a poem which is full of onomatopoeic effects, uh, where it describes his love for a beautiful village girl or woman by the name of Elif. And uh, he equates everything that happens in nature with her beauty and with his love for her. Uh, the poem says it's untranslatable. It's so full of very special <coughs> effects in Turkish that I can only give you the theme and then recite the poem for you so that you'll get a sense of the flow of the, of the language. And, and this love song says, well, uh, snow, snowflakes drift like a leaf and calling out a leaf's name. And uh, my heart has become a frenzied uh, poet who uh, roams about uh, crying out a leaf, a leaf. And then at one point he likens a leaf to uh, smelling like mountain flowers or uh, like a green-headed duck floating on the, uh, on the, on the water. And uh, then at, at the end, uh, after all this exhilarated uh, uh, praise for the beautiful girl in terms of natural images, uh, he is gripped by his despair in love and cries out for her. I'll read it to you only in Turkish. İncecikten bir kar yağar, tozar elif elif diye. Deli gönül aptal olmuş, gezer elif elif diye. Elifin uğrun akışlı, yavru balaban bakışlı. Yayla çiçeği kokuşlu, kokar elif elif diye. Elif kaşlarını çatar, gamzası sinema batar, akelleri kalem tutar, yazar elif elif diye. Evlerinin önü çardak, Elif'in elinde bardak. Sanki yeşil başlı ördek yüzer Elif, Elif diye. Karaca olan eğmelerin, gönül sevmez değmelerin, iliklenmiş düğmelerin çözer Elif, Elif diye. This too has a song like most folk poems. And I'm sure most of you know me, we can sing it together. İncecikten bir kar yağar, Tozar elif, elif diye Deli gönül abdal olmuş Gezer elif, elif diye It goes on like that. It's a lovely lyric like that. And in modern times, uh, many women poets were uh, giving us poignant <laughs> poems about the, the, their situation. There's one by the most prominent living woman poet of Turkey, <coughs> Turkey by the name of Gülten Akın, not the fear of shivering. We are the tired warriors, worn down by defeat after defeat, too timid or ashamed to enjoy a drink. Someone gathers all the sons, keeps people waiting for them. It is not the fear of shivering, but warming up. We are the tired warriors. So many loves frightened us all. They have held the mountain roads. The arrows are shot, the traps are set. Someone forgives our ugliness in the name of friendship. We set out on flat roads again without arrows or rabbits. We are the daunted warriors. So many loves frightened us all. <clears throat> Another very famous poem in the uh, modern Turkish tradition is by Nazım Hikmet with whose poems I started this presentation. Because he was a communist, he spent many years in Turkish prisons and then uh, escaped from Turkey and went to the Soviet Union. He became a Polish citizen and lived in exile until his death at the age of 62 in the year 1963 of a heart attack. And some of his letters uh, from prison are among the best specimens of not only the profundis literature, of prison literature, but also they rank among the best love poems written in any language. And I'll read to you a poem that he wrote to his wife. It's a type of merely letter from prison. My only one, in your last letter you say, my head is aching, my heart is bewildered. You say, if they hang you, if I lose you, I cannot live. You will live, my darling wife. 
My memory will fade like black smoke in the wind. You will live, my heart's red-haired woman. In the 20th century, mourning the dead lasts but one year. Death, a corpse swinging at the end of a rope. I cannot resign my heart to such a death. But you can be sure, my beloved, that the hand, the hairy hand of a poor gypsy, like a black spider, puts the noose around my neck. They will look in vain into the blue eyes of Nazim to see fear. In the dim light of my last dawn, I will see my friends and you, and I will only take to the grave the sorrow of an unfinished song. My wife, my very own, my tender-hearted bee, with eyes sweeter than honey, why did I ever write you? They asked for a death sentence. The trial is only just starting, and they don't pluck a man's head like a turnip. One of the great modernizers of modern Turkey in poetry was a man by the name of Orhan Veli who died in 1950 uh, prematurely at age 36. One of the greatest talents uh, that Turkish poetry had ever produced and his loss was um, irretrievable, irremediable. Uh, and he left behind many short poems. Some of them are uh, known by heart by many Turks, and uh, they're used as proverbial expressions in daily conversation at times, and uh, some people don't even remember that they were original poems written by, by this man. Uh, what one is uh, very famous and uh, very relevant for so many societies. It's a three-line poem which is entitled for our country. All the things we did for our country, some of us died, some of us gave speeches. He also wrote a kidding poem about women. It's entitled, For the Hell of It. All the pretty women thought the poems I wrote on love were meant for them, and I always felt badly about having written them just for the hell of it. A close friend of his, who died only less than two years ago, uh, Oktay Rifat, uh, wrote a love poem called Self-Revelation. I've got this enormous problem. I'm terrible at arithmetic, yet I'm employed as a bookkeeper. My favorite dish is eggplant, but it upsets my stomach. I know a girl with freckles. I love her. She doesn't love me and a very tender short poem by one of their contemporaries, Zia Osman Saba, entitled merely Love Poem. When you think of me, say a few nice words. Smile if you see me in the street. Come close, stay a while, your hand in mine. Let me visit you at your home. Make me coffee. Out of a freshly filled pitcher, pour me water. That's all I want. And the, perhaps the greatest living poet of Turkey, Fazlı Sudal Larca, has some very short poems, uh, some of which are uh, so quintessential, they're epigrams, they can be used as poetic uh, proverbs even. Uh, once he wrote uh, the following lines, whenever I love a woman, I know that before me, God loved her. Or, to love is to double the world. Cats. The widow's cat is warmer than the bride's cat. Again, Nazim Hikmet uh, wrote one short poem which expresses the optimism of love and uh, the good days to come, all the better things that will happen in the world in the future. And that starts with the most beautiful mm -hmm. ocean is the one we have not yet crossed. The most beautiful child has yet to grow up. Our most beautiful days are those we have not yet lived. The loveliest things I'd like to tell you, I have yet to tell you. In the tradition of the Turkish arts, miniature painting holds a very important place. And what else, of course, for the depiction of love, but the painting of Adam and Eve. Not done in any stylistic term, but almost in a naive fashion, with Adam and Eve holding uh, hands. 
in a very human, in a very lovely uh, depiction of them, while the angel looks on, and as you can see, to the left of uh, Eve, there's the snake, of course. So this captures all the exuberance of that, good flowers and, and plants, and uh, uh, a peacock, as you can see, and, and all that was very much part of the tradition of visual arts depicting love in the Turkish tradition. In the 13th century, there emerged a great philosopher of Sufism, of Islamic mysticism, by the name of Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, who is known in the Western world mainly as Rumi, and the sect that was started in his name to honor his humanistic uh, philosophy of, of mysticism is known in the Western world as the Whirling Dervishes. The Whirling Dervishes visited the United States uh, two or three times in the past, and there's a possibility they'll come back this year, if not next year, on another tour. They do their religious rituals. Uh, they are Muslims, devout, but they represent a different mainstream of Islamic philosophical and spiritual tradition, different ethical values all, almost more humane, more humanistic, and, and less given to the basic rules and traditions of, of Islam as experienced and as practiced by the um, Orthodox believers. Uh, these sects are mainly unorthodox, and they were considered uh, throughout Ottoman history either as being outside of the tradition or completely heterodox, and many of them were, of course, considered and combated against as heretical. Uh, Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi uh, lived from 1207 to 1273 in the city of Konya in the heartland of Anatolia. And there he wrote his very beautiful poems, mostly in Persian, a few in Turkish. And of course, in recent years particularly, there's been a very brisk <coughs> translation activity to render his poetry into English. And he too, like Yunus Emre, whom he preceded by just two or three decades, uh, expressed the same ideas of uh, human qualities and human values transcending uh, narrow religious schisms, etc. Rumi wrote, the religion of love is apart from all religions. The lovers of God have no religion but God alone. And he gave a uh, high status to women in society. He said, and this could have been expressed by um, modern feminists, actually. He wrote, woman is God's light, not the mere object of man's delight. That, for the 13th century, was a very progressive, very advanced view. And of course, in his sect, the inducing of ecstasy through gradual whirling to mesmerizing music holds a very important place. It has a very fine symbolism, as I'll mention in a second when I show the dervishes doing the, the whirling. And uh, Mehran Jaltin Rumi wrote uh, universalist poems. He invited everyone to come to his uh, lyceum in the uh, middle of the city of Konya, uh, which is one of the burgeoning cities of uh, mid Anatolia today. And uh, he said, come to my temple, because that is the temple for all loving hearts. It is that green dome there, which uh, looks authentic, but um, it was actually restored uh, with quite a bit of precise work in the 19th century, so it's not the original dome, but the very close um, approximation of it. And this was, for him, the uh, temple for all uh, loving hearts. You could only come there having abandoned your crass instincts and having turned your back on national and denominational and religious differences. He said, in all mosques, temples, churches, I find one shrine low. And he advised everybody to live in love's ecstasy, for love is all that exists. His followers, known as the whirling dervishes, uh, do this ritual for about a total of 40 minutes. Uh, four sections, each known as salutations or celebrations. And they wear these immaculate white robes with flowing skirts. 
the robes represent essentially the shroud because they feel that unless they achieve that sense of ecstasy by, by whirling and by uh, a sense of elevation going closer to the great beloved who is God, uh, until that moment they are dead unto themselves and they come alive through the trance, through the ecstasy, through the elevation that they're able to induce in themselves. And they always turn from left to right, left because left is where the heart is and the heart is where love resides. And they do their turns very graciously. They never touch one another. They're like living statues in, in motion. But uh, there's no obscenity in all this. It's all very ethereal, spiritually, very beautiful. And it's not really choreographed. They, they just turn with heads slightly tilted to one side in submission, uh, in reverence to, to God. And the right hand opens up this way while the arm is extended and the left arm opens the other way and the hand points downward. The symbolism of that is that they receive the benediction and the beauty of God and without keeping anything in their bodies because that they consider would be selfish, it would be crass selfhood. But they receive that benediction from God and they transmit it through their body. They of course become cleansed and purified in the process themselves but they transmit it, they give it to the earth, to the world, to other human beings who are in need of the same spiritual excitement. And while doing this, they experience inner enlightenment and sort of elevation that will bring them close to God. And of course, their ultimate desire, their ultimate hope is to catch a glimpse of the beautiful face of the God. And this way, there's a complete divinization of the human being or humanization of God because for them the beauty, the spiritual beauty of the human beloved isn't any different from the beauty of God. We human beings, they say, unlike the duality that's established by traditional Islam, that they say we believe that we are parts of God. We are here temporarily to be sure but by experiencing God we'll be able to have our ultimate reunion spiritually with God and therefore we share God's existence and we share God's love. But that makes the metaphor very beautiful indeed. And when two human beings are joined together or when the believer is together with, uh, the, uh, with God, with the Godhead, then that is the most blissful spiritual state imaginable. Blessed moment, here we sit in this palace of love, you and I. We have two shapes, two bodies, but a single soul, you and I. The colors of the gardens and the songs of the birds among the flower beds will make us immortal, you and I. That was the spirit that exuded from Rumi's poetry. But he also wrote about the importance of peace, not only in the heart, not only among individuals, but also among communities and religions and nations in the whole world. Again, statements that he was making more than 750 years ago. When weapons and ignorance come together, tyrants arise to destroy the world with their cruelty. And he wrote a couplet, which is one of the most beautiful expressions of the supremacy of love over conflicts and rifts. He said, Whatever you think of war, I'm far, far from it. Whatever you think of love, I'm that, only that, all that. In the same tradition, there emerged also a lot of humor. In the, presumably in the 13th century, there lived a very humorous character in the small town of Akshahir in um, central Anatolia. Uh, and Nasreddin Hoca, who came to embody Turkish humor and satire. There are hundreds of anecdotes that were originated by him or that are attributed to him. He has become a sort of living embodiment of uh, Turkish humor throughout the centuries. But he's popular not only in Turkey, but in all the Islamic lands, in all the Arab countries. In Iran, they know him not as Nasreddin Hoca, but as Mullah Nasreddin, 
their tradition. He is even famous in the Turkish and Islamic communities of China. Uh, in fact, uh, th there is in the city of Samarkand a monument erected for him which shows him riding his donkey backwards uh, as a sort of uh, side gag. And uh, he was not a very romantic man, as you can imagine, because he used to make fun of everybody. He was a s sort of, um, I don't know, um, Mark Twain and um, George Bernard Shaw and um, Russell Baker uh, all lumped together. Uh, also, lots of practical jokes. Um, and uh, one of his uh, stories that can be indirectly and irreverently related to love is um, they made arrangements for him to marry a woman. Of course, in those days you didn't see the face of your wife in Islamic society when you married her. Uh, she had a veil and the marriage uh, vows were uh, concluded and he took the veil off that night and saw that she was an unbelievably ugly woman. And uh, the next morning, she kept asking him, she said, well, to whom can I show my face? Because there are degrees in which you can do that. Do you show your face to the brothers of your husband, to friends, to outsiders under certain circumstances, etc." And he said, woman, he said, as long as you don't show me your face, you can show it to anybody. <laughs> When the Ottoman state emerged, and by the middle of the 15th century, and certainly by the beginning of the 16th century, became a full-fledged world empire, world-class empire, created a lot of architecture, and uh, many important genres flourished, uh, particularly in the city of Istanbul. And uh, the sultans <coughs> took a great deal of delight in poetry, not only in listening to it recited by the major poets, but they were writing poetry themselves. E.J.W. Gibb, who at the turn of the century uh, wrote a six-volume monumental history of Ottoman poetry, uh, observes that two-thirds of all the sultans of the Ottoman dynasty, uh, 24, poets out of 30, uh, 24 sultans out of 36, uh, were able to write poetry, and some were very fine poets indeed. <coughs> and this was now a city of not only great economic power and political power, but at the same time a city of artistic achievement, a new civilization which created its own synthesis, and at the same time a very fine literary achievement. The conqueror of that city <coughs> was Fatih Sultan Mehmet, a uh, very great sultan. Uh, he was able to conquer the city uh, when he was only about 22, 23 years old, possibly as young as 21, and crushed Byzantium altogether, and uh, then expanded the territories of, of the state uh, by conquering many countries and, and many towns. And here he is depicted in a miniature painting and if um, they tell you that in Islam there's an interdiction, there's a ban against the depiction of the human form and face, uh, take that with a grain of salt. Some uh, very conservative, ultra-conservative religious teachers want to interpret the Quran that way, but in the Quran there's not one single ban against the depiction of the human form. The only thing that did not develop in Islamic countries was sculpture but Turkey was able to make amends for that by um, creating uh, hundreds, thousands of monuments throughout the, the, the country from the late 1920s onwards. So there's at least one major Muslim country where the new tradition of, of sculpture has been growing. But in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, and in other conservative Muslim countries, you will never see a statue or a monument depicting the human body or the human face. But the Ottoman sultans posed for painters. They want to uh, have future de generations remember the way they looked, the, remember the way they were. And they, they invited some of the great artists of portraiture from uh, Italy. Uh, Sultan Mehmed posed for many days for the great Gentile Bellini, uh, who came from Italy at his invitation 
to do his portraits. So the Ottoman sultans weren't like that. In the museum of the top of the palace in Istanbul alone, there are more than 13,000 miniature paintings, the vast majority of which have the human face and human form. And in a few minutes, I'll show you many, many other depictions of uh, human beings, not only the sultans, but people in the street, or also the Prophet Muhammad. But the only thing about the Prophet Muhammad was that they would never portray his face. They would show his figure. They, they would depict some of the major episodes of his life and of the emergence of Islam as a religion. But his face would be completely uh, white without any features. Uh, but everybody else, including Jesus, who was <coughs> depicted in quite a few Ottoman miniature paintings, uh, have their visible faces. Now, this man was well educated. He knew several languages other than Turkish, and he was able to write poetry, very good poetry, not only in Turkish, but in Persian as well. And uh, he uh, often pitted himself against his lover, and uh, he found it ironic that as the Sultan was such immense power, he was basically a slave at the door of, of his beloved. He said, it takes no bow before the royal crown, rejects the throne, but it's your slave for life. The heart is the strangest of kings. And he also wrote about the importance of peace. Since death shall put an end to strife and bring forth peace one day, enough, what good is all this senseless fighting in the world? And then he proceeded to crush 17 countries and capture 200 towns and cities. The capture of Istanbul by the Sultan has been celebrated in many poems, uh, classical as well as modern. And uh, one of the most famous is by the greatest living poet of Tur Turkey, Fazlı Sündal Arca. And it exudes love for the city of Istanbul. City love is almost a spiritual experience among Turks. The Istanbul was considered in itself a great masterpiece, and the sultans want to build it that way. Uh, a couplet which was written at the time of the sultan, shortly after the capture of Istanbul, where the ideology of the young sultan was to create Istanbul as a very glorious achievement of Ottoman civilization without doing away with the marvelous legacy of the Byzantine Istanbul, uh, a couplet said, it is the true art to create a glorious city and to fill the hearts of its people with felicity. That became the great ideal for the Ottomans. And with that love, Fazlı Sudal uh, about 40 years ago, composed a book about the conquest of Istanbul. And I'll read to you uh, the poem, the introduction to, to that book, uh, and I'll show you quick glimpses of the various parts and sites of the city of Istanbul. Now the darkness of time, like the night, passes where no shadows roam. There the shores that breathe with God and Byzantium torn apart from Rome. Spring is the burden that the monks with dangling beards must bear huge and heavy with rocks and grudge on the crenellated banks flanking nowhere. Ancient Istanbul, as old as the soul, defies man's age and record. A void that spreads along the flavor of the lakes, our time has plunged into all or nothing. Over seven unknowns, the seven hills fling. The golden horn makes no move, but the water hemmed in flurries the sleep of the sleepless passes bright in the, into the bulk of the centuries. Ancient Istanbul, beyond the reach of memory, should be savored gently without hurry. The moments of Darius and Sardinapellus have come to ruin by ships and caravans teeming stark naked. Those who lost and found love have poured in. Asian generations stopped at her gates age by age, adoring the eyes of the antelope. The prophet's armies sought her warm dream with resounding outcries of hope. Ancient Istanbul, truly old, where history remains untold. Body and soul yearning in the pangs of thirst past the time that all the beauties span. Sultan Mehmet, the Ottoman emperor, one day at dawn marched his galleons over land. 
He placed his cannons row by row in love, facing fancy on each side. In the evening sun, like the tulip, the brave Janissary died. Ancient Istanbul, city of the past, whose winds reach God with each gust. A fog that cloaks the gardens, faces, and the world. Tongues and creeds came closer in those days. Out of dungeons restored to life and light, handwritten books rejoice in dreams and rays. Towards the skies of God, here the love of the world has begun. By the early part of the 16th century, the Ottomans were conquering new territories, and one of the great conquering sultans who inspired fear all over the Middle East, he captured all of the sacred places of Islam and uh, took on the title of Caliph, the uh, chief of the entire Muslim community of the world, roughly comparable to the status of Pope in the, in the Catholic world. And um, he captured uh, all of Iran, he captured all of Iraq, and perhaps you know, in retrospect we can say that maybe he should have held on to those places or the Turks should have never let go. We wouldn't have had all this unpleasantness of the past 10, 12 years. Uh, but the Europeans were very afraid of him, and they called him Selim the Grim. That man wearing an earring very elegantly. But he was actually a poetic soul who composed verses in three languages. And in one poem, he confessed that he had become a victim, although he was a powerful sultan, he had become a victim of his beloved woman. While lions were trembling in my crushing paw, fate made me fall prey to a doe-eyed darling. His son, Suleiman the Magnificent, was perhaps the greatest of all sultans, and a very fine poet who wrote 3,000 poems which have come down to us. He spent more than 10 years of his life on horseback, leading his armies in military campaigns, as far north as uh, uh, Vienna, uh, which he was never able to capture, but at least Turks, as the Turkish historians like to say, went all the way to the gates of Vienna, and all the way down to lower or southern Iraq, and doubled the Ottoman territories, and became the greatest artistic sultan. He was an art patron who maintained a studio of painters on the grounds of the top of the palace, where at one point as many as 29 painters, 15 of them European painters, 14 Ottoman Turkish painters, were working together to create oil paintings and miniature <coughs> paintings to capture the glory of the age. So we have dozens and dozens of uh, pictures, both paintings as well as miniature paintings of Suleiman the, the Magnificent. And he was writing such poems as, my heart be satisfied with one morsel to eat and a simple cloak to wear. Don't you see how possessions drag the people of the world into warfare? And yet he kept conquering. Here he is driving his armies toward Mohac in Hungary, where he won a major victory and as a result of it was able to uh, possess all of Hungarian territory. And in some of his poems, he was declaring himself the Sultan of Love. I am the Sultan of Love. For crown on my head, all I need is a wine cup. My tears spread over me the mantle of honor. Let world events rage like the turbulent sea. I will not set sail. Thank God the ship of your love is an anchor for me. I desire neither the emperor's throne nor the wealth of Croesus, for it is my good fortune to be a slave in your palace. You may sometimes treat me kindly and sometimes inflict torture. <coughs> My beloved, whatever you do is all the same to me. O oh, lover, all I need over my head is the flame of my side. I am the sultan of love. On my right and left, tears march like my troops. And he was a romantic spirit. He was no harem monger like some of his predecessors and most of his successors. He fell desperately in love 
with a young concubine named originally Roxelana. And uh, she was perhaps Russian or Ukrainian or Polish. We don't really know. The documents don't tell us enough. But of course, uh, after she was given to Suleiman as a slave, as a gift, uh, she was made to convert to Islam. And her name was changed to Hurrem, which roughly means joy giving somebody who renders you happy, etc. And the Ottoman sultans normally did not marry their women. They had their choice of women. They had sometimes hundreds of concubines they could choose from. And they would bear children to the sultan. But the religious establishment did not want them to be married. Only three sultans out of 36 were actually married. And the first and the most important one was Suleiman the Magnificent who insisted on the marriage vows and had a sort of conflict with the religious conservatives of his time, but he prevailed. And it is said that for 25 years, until his wife's death, he remained loyal and faithful to her and was monogamous. But she was a conniving woman, and uh, she caused Suleiman to make many wrong decisions about some state affairs and about his children from uh, former women. And uh, that happens to be a blemish on his record and the shame of Ottoman history, as a matter of fact. But he was truly, deeply in love with this woman. And uh, when he would go out on his uh, various uh, campaigns, he would send poems to her as love letters. One is very famous, which I've translated into English. And in, in it, he calls her my sultan. That was he even abandons his title of, of sultan to give the honor to her. And uh, he uh, uses figures of speech, metaphors, that uh, go one after another in, in quick fashion. And uh, it's, it's, it's lovely the way he expresses his love to her. I'll read to you only a part of that poem. He says, my very own queen, my everything, my beloved, my bright moon, my intimate companion, my one and all, sovereign of all beauties, my sultan, my life, the gift I own, my elixir of paradise, my Eden, my spring, my joy, my glittering day, my exquisite one who smiles on and on, my sheer delight, my revelry, my feast, my torch, my sunshine, my sun in heaven, my orange, my pomegranate, the flaming candle that lights up my pavilion, my plant, my candy, my treasure who gives no sorrow but the world's purest pleasure, my saint, dearest, my turtle dove, my all, the ruler of my heart's Egyptian dominion, my Istanbul, my caravan, and all the Anatolian lands that are mine, my Badakhshan and my Kipchak territories, my Baghdad and my Khorasan. And he goes on like that, paying tribute to, uh, in effusive terms. When uh, the present president of Turkey, uh, when he was uh, prime minister, uh, the great exhibition in Washington, D.C., featuring the age of Suleiman the Magnificent opened. And uh, that exhibition featured some of the masterpieces of Ottoman creativity in the 16th century. And uh, Prime Minister Rizal was going to open that exhibition. Uh, but uh, he was delayed because of state business and couldn't come to the opening. But he came to Washington a few days later and was addressing a very large group of Americans, uh, businessmen and politicians, etc. And uh, the speech was written for him. Now, uh, in Turkish, uh, in the Ottoman and Turkish tradition, Suleyman the Magnificent was always known as Suleyman the Lawgiver, or the Legislator, Kanuni, the Canon uh, divisor, so to speak. Uh, but lawgiver sounds a bit um, uh, arrogant uh, when you use it with an American audience, because here nobody gives the people the laws. The people make the laws themselves. Uh, and the term is lawmaker for senators and, and members of, of Congress. Uh, so the speechwriter used, in reference to Suleiman the Magnificent, lawmaker uh, rather than the ma magnificent. And uh, Azal, whose English is uh, quite serviceable and, and fluent, but, but not per perfect, 
uh, read it as Suleiman the lovemaker. <laughs> I didn't even catch uh, there. Uh, but a year later, the, the same exhibition opened in London, and his wife, uh, the redoubtable uh, Mrs. Azal, was there for, for the opening, and she gave a little speech, and the royal family of England was represented by Princess Di. And she too read the same speech, and read again lawgiver, lawmaker as lovemaker. And it's, uh, they say, Princess Di died laughing. <laughs> and it was during the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, and after his death, that the great Ottoman architect Sinan was building some of the major mosques of Istanbul, including the Suleymaniye. And for Suleyman, he built on commission the Shehzade Mosque, the Mosque of the Prince, uh, which represents a father's love for his son. Uh, the son, Mehmet, the Prince, who was probably going to become a very fine sultan himself, died of an illness. And Suleyman, who had eight sons and, and one daughter, was uh, crestfallen. He was uh, devastated. And according to the records of that day, he spent three days and three nights sitting by the coffin and weeping. He did not even drink a, a sip of water during that period. And when he came out, uh, after having sat by the coffin for three days and three nights, he said, uh, Sinan, our architect, should build the Shehzadeh, the Prince Mosque, for my son. And it was built very far, very near uh, to the great mosque that had been created by the same architect for Suleiman himself. And here we see the minarets of the two mosques uh, almost embracing each other like a father and son. For his only daughter, they, they built for Mihramah, the only daughter he had, they, they built the Mihramah mosque with a single very elegant <coughs> minaret. That was also an expression of love. And uh, it is one of the most uh, graceful, one of the most exquisite mosques in all of Turkey. And inside, it is a wonder of poetic design. It is as if the possibilities of geometric and, and floral design had been exhausted in this interior. It is so joyful, so wonderful, that it, it really uh, uh, is quite different from some of the austere mosque interiors in the Islamic world, including the, the Ottoman Turkey. But this one is full of joy, full of light, full of the exuberance of the human spirit, full of love. Suleiman's uh, miniature painters accompanied him on his far-flung conquests and, and trips. And uh, wherever they went, they uh, did miniature paintings of the cities, be they in Europe or in the Middle East. And here we have the small Anatolian city town of Ulukishla, done in the mid-16th century by a remarkably versatile man who was not only a miniature painter, but also a historian and mathematician. He invented a <coughs> game of mock battle, which became very popular in Turkey. His name was Matrak Chinasu, and his, that first designation means the creator of the game called Matrak, which in today's Turkish and slang particularly is used as putting somebody on or, or having fun at somebody else's expense, etc. And here it's almost a modern painting, a very different sense of perspective, and look at the color combinations. It evokes a city in beauty and in color in a very unusual way, which was, in its time, a deviation from the basic norms of miniature painting. And th this tile uh, of uh, birds of paradise, uh, birds of love, if you will, uh, is now at the uh, Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Rugs, of course, represented the love of the human being for God, the sense of reverence, praying to God five times a day. This is a 16th century prayer rug, <coughs> one of the masterpieces of the genre, and very well preserved, actually. Again, the, the tiles capture the sense of love that Turkish artists 
exuded, and flowers were considered very important in the Ottoman state. The Habsburg ambassador to the court of Suleiman the Magnificent, who brought some marvelous letters, which have been collected and published in many languages, uh, Buzbek, a very important statesman of the time, who spent several years in Istanbul, wrote the following about the Ottomans. He said, one of the pleasantest traits of the Ottoman is the universal love of flowers. It is almost a religion for him. Even military privilege is obliged to give way to it, for soldiers on the march are strictly forbidden to tread on roses and other flowers. And that sense, that sense of joy is uh, shown in this uh, tile, uh, which happens to be in the top of the palace, the residence of the sultans, where, of course, uh, they maintain their harem as well. The embroidery uh, was a very important hobby with uh, many Ottomans. Even some of the sultans, believe it or not, although they were martial figures, etc., had embroidery as their hobby. And there, there was a wonderful tradition which still continues. Uh, it is not impossible to achieve perfection when you make a design while you're embroidering. And uh, the embroiderer, when he or she feels that perfection is uh, very close, deliberately uh, inserts an error, <coughs> so-called intentional error, uh, so, so that he or she will underline the fact that perfection belongs to God, that he too or she too could have achieved that, but must surrender to the higher authority of God and creativity. Selim II, Suleiman's son, who was a lesser sultan and a drunkard, uh, was a very fine poet who wrote beautiful uh, love poems. I'll now read to you a short poem by Fazal Sudal Erger, a modern poet, who tried to capture in a poem the great majesty, the, the grandeur of the Ottoman sultans. And he uh, makes an imaginary, a fictitious Ottoman sultan by the name of Halim III. There was never a sultan called Halim, certainly no Halim III. And uh, he expresses the pride of Ottoman civilization. Uh, this happens to be actually a subsequent miniature painting done about 300 years later of the creator of the Ottoman state, Osman. The term Ottoman is derived from his name. He was the founder of the Ottoman state. But this is not accurate, of course. It's done from imagination uh, three centuries later. But we'll start with uh, a poem entitled Audience by Fasul Sudal Erce, by his image. I am Halim III, majestic and sacred, king of kings. When my white hands move, my subjects come upon their mornings. The moments I conquer carry my lust to unknown virgins time and again. I discover time in the golden pleasure of my enduring reign. Along my wisdom they stretch all the world's dimensions. Comfort flows from my body into my palaces and stately mansions. In legion with the mighty eagles, I set science, poetry, and victory free so that generations to come may rejoice on land and sea. Noble and hail, glorious and supreme, farther than the mind's eye can see through. I am Halim III, mountains and rocks, who are you? Those sultans deteriorated in later centuries because many of them became harem bound. They were inept. There was uh, degeneracy in the dynasty. Although the empire lasted well into the uh, second decade of our century, it was in decline for a very, very long time. And part of that decline was at the time of this man, Murat III, who was a sex, sex maniac. Uh, he, sighed, he had about 400 concubines in the harem the largest number ever, and uh, he had 136 children. 
imagine the succession fights among them. And the Ottomans were, were given to feasts and enjoyment of life, which is all right, but they were neglecting state affairs. This in the latter part of the 16th century shows uh, commander-in-chief and grand vizier uh, giving a banquet to his officers near the city of Izmit. And Murat IV tried to resuscitate the glory of the empire. He reconquered Baghdad, for instance. He too was a fine poet, and once, for instance, he sent a communique uh, in verse, in complete meter and rhyme, to his commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And the commander-in-chief, in the best Ottoman tradition, answered in kind, using the same poetic meter and the same rhyme scheme, sent his official reply back to the Sultan. Imagine that, for instance, between Truman and MacArthur, or between President Bush and uh, Chief of Staff uh, Colin Powell. But the Ottomans uh, really reveled in poetry like that, so much so that in the 19th century, when uh, they had to compose texts of uh, chemistry, for instance, a text came out for, for, for school children uh, in complete meter and rhyme, uh, a chemistry textbook. I don't know if MSU has ever produced a technical book like that in complete meter and rhyme. And uh, also in the 19th century, there were uh, dictionaries in verse, uh, Turkish, French, Armenian, Turkish, Greek, Turkish, etc. They are wonderful. I'll just read to you a couple of lines from a Turkish-French dictionary, which goes as follows. It's, it's all in meter and rhyme. Allah, Dieu, gökler, sieur, yer, ter, commence, tida. Daim toujours, infini, be intaha. It goes on like that. Thousands of words in Turkish and French, rhyming and in meter. I wonder if you could guess what this is. This is actually a tombstone. It's so colorful and such flower designs, tulips and, and roses, and it has a sense of joy, tremendous joy. Of course, the inscription is uh, La ilaha illallah Muhammad and Rasulullah, the basic art of the faith uh, of, of Islam. Um, uh, that there's no God but God, and uh, Muhammad is his messenger. And um, in the Ottoman tradition, uh, the art of the tombstone became a genre in itself, a very important genre. And uh, in the city of Istanbul, particularly, one sees tens of thousands of tombstones in all shapes uh, with turbans, etc. The sizes vary. That too was a basic departure from Islamic tradition. For instance, in uh, the very orthodox, very conservative Islamic communities, they go by the statement that the Prophet had presumably made that the best grave, best tomb, is the one that disappears from the face of the earth. That's why in many Muslim countries there are really no uh, cemeteries in the true sense of the word and no elaborate tombs or gravestones, etc. But not in Turkey. They, they reveled in the art of the tombstone and the epitaph, too. I, I will read to you some epitaphs which are related to love. These are all authentic, collected recently from uh, tombstones in Istanbul. One of them says, Pity, Mr. Ismail caught the illness of love at age 70 and dashed full tilt to paradise. Another one says, I could have died just as easily without that quack that my friends unleashed against me. Another says, stopping his ears with his fingers, Judge Mehmet dashed out of this beautiful world, leaving his wife gabbling and his mother-in-law cackling. And the romantic epitaph that I like best, I, I wish when I die they were going to put it on my uh, tombstone, says, I've been away from you for a long time. But in soil, in air, in clouds, in rain, in flowers, in butterflies and birds, I am always with you. In the early part of the 18th century, Sultan Ahmed III heralded a new age which lasted roughly from uh, 1718 uh, through and its abrupt end as a result of a popular uprising against the Sultan as government in the year 1730. And that was a period of tremendous festivities and entertainment and 
feasts and banquets, mainly, of course, for the benefit of the Sultan and his entourage, but a lot of the common people of Istanbul <coughs> participated in it too. It was a time of lovemaking and happiness and frivolity, etc. But gradually, because of all that, people started suffering because monies that could have been used for their benefit were being squandered by the Sultan because of his sybaritic pleasures, etc. And that came to an abrupt end. But that left behind one of the most glorious fountains uh, dedicated as a memorial to the Sultan's mother. The reverence for mothers in Islamic and Ottoman culture goes as consistently been very high and uh, remains so in modern Turkey as reverence for mothers happens to be in, in all cultures, of course. But um, the uh, Prophet Muhammad also had said, paradise lies at the feet of mothers. Although he did not always uh, give equality to women on an equal footing with, with men, unfortunately. Uh, but at least in terms of the reverence and love for mothers, the Muslims and the Ottomans did their best. And this happens to be one of those glorious monuments. But that period was a time of merriment. Here, this man or a woman, a drink giver probably, drinking and having a wonderful time, enjoying life, the love of the beauties and the comforts of life and all the nice things that one can do. And uh, they were building pleasure palaces. They even uh, diverted the course of a river uh, in order to have a better view of the boats passing by. And the women were having a grand time too. It was shortly after this period that Casanova uh, went to Istanbul as a young man and uh, writes in his memoirs, of course, and he stayed three months there and confesses that he did not make a single conquest in three months, but he himself was seduced by a man called Ismail Effendi. <laughs> In the late 18th century and early 19th century, a poet uh, wrote a whole book of uh, Zena Name, uh, a book of women, in, in which he wrote in glowing terms about beautiful women from many different countries and uh, ethnic backgrounds. He did not like s some women. He had very nasty things to say about American women for some reason. But the English, uh, woman, he said, is, is wonderful. He wrote, the English woman has a lovely face. She has a sweet voice, nice manners, much grace. Next to her cheeks, crimson roses are pale. Her mouth teaches songs to the nightingale. They all are pure in spirit and in heart. With all of them, adornment is an art. They display such grandeur and elegance. Their speech possesses the best elegance. And he thought the Greek women were probably the best in the world. The fount of life, if love is what you seek, then make sure your beloved is a Greek. Tender garlands adorn a Greek girl's face. Next to her, all other women lack grace. Waist so slender, body nimble and slight, each word on her sweet tongue a sheer delight. Oh, the joys of her captivating talk, the elegance of her enchanting walk. Like a cypress she stands there, proud and tall, among God's trees, the loveliest of all. She charms the soul, does away with distress. She is surely the ultimate mistress. She conquers all men sooner or later, even the old henpecked woman hater. That was his phrase of Greek. So if they tell you that there's disagreement between Greeks and Turks, don't believe it. At least one early 19th century Ottoman poet just raved about the Greeks. And uh, they were produced in the Ottoman period uh, miniature paintings that had partial nudity. Uh, unlike Indian miniature painters, the Ottomans did not really produce too many pornographic or obscene miniature paintings, but some of them have a very lovely and discreet depiction of uh, naked women. And this one is the bathing woman. Uh, produced sometime in the first half of the 19th century. And the Ottoman women were having a grand time. You know, uh, they were on swings. I suppose we could call them swinging Ottoman women. And, uh, and they were enjoying
enjoying the pleasure gardens of the place. And some were, were writing poems that were quite uh, obviously uh, flying in the face of the orthodox uh, people of the religious establishment. For instance, there was a Leila Hanum who died in 1847, and she too had lots of affairs, etc. And, and she was writing poems with a devil may care attitude. Let's get started on with the festivities. Pay no heed to all the gossip. Drink wine with your lover, pay no heed to all the gossip. What do I care whether people approve or not? God bless those I love, pay no heed to all the gossip. Leila, plunge into pleasure with the one you love. Make the best of life, pay no heed to all the gossip. Abdulhamid I was a very weak sultan and a romantic man who fell in love with one of his concubines. And the concubine, believe it or not, was playing very hard to get. And although it was her duty to uh, do f sexual favors, uh, not even favors, do her duty uh, for, for the sultan, she, she was refusing to have anything to do with him. And he kept sending, in the same palace, under the same roof, letters, desperate letters to her. Her name was Ruh Shah, saying, I want to kiss your feet, I want to be your slave. Please favor me by coming into my bedroom just this night. Give me only one night and that will be paradise for me. Letters like that, uh, really prostrating himself uh, in the most abject terms imaginable. And she was holding out and he kept sending her letters, which have all been preserved in his handwriting at the palace. And uh, he was married at one point to a uh, woman by the name of Aimé, who also, of course, uh, was converted to Islam and became Nakhchidil Sultan, and uh, married Abdulhamid I. But Abdulhamid's uh, uh, nephew, Selim III, who was a very romantic sultan, composer, musician, and, and, and poet, uh, he fe fell in love with her, and they had a sort of secret love affair. And, uh, uh, through her, she was French from the island of Martinique, and she was the cousin of Josephine, who later became uh, Napoleon's wife and the empress of, uh, uh, of France. And they corresponded, they <coughs> discovered about one another, they had uh, lost one another for some years, and then one emerged as the empress of the Ottoman Empire, the other as the empress of the French Empire. And, uh, this man wrote beautiful love, love poems and composed songs which are still being performed today. He also composed the whole cycle of music for the ceremonies of the whirling dervishes to whom he was very close uh, spiritually. And this was a depiction done by a European artist of Aimé. In modern times, uh, in 1923, the Republic of uh, Turkey emerged under the guidance and the heroic leadership of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who, uh, as a statesman, has probably had, has, still has more love lavished on him than uh, virtually any other statesman that one can think of. If we uh, measure that love by the number of monuments erected in his honor and by the literature of praise and elegies that have, uh, has emerged, uh, but by my reckoning, at least 10 to 15,000 poems praising Atatürk have so far been published. And the industry goes on every year. There are hundreds of new poems praising Atatürk and his contribution to Turkey. And here, in a very <coughs> loving painting by a modern painter, he is shown in his uh, uh, ideal of vision and westernization he wanted to be known as a Western-oriented statesman and uh, valued the arts enormously. Once he said uh, to a group of politicians, uh, cabinet members and members of parliament, etc., he said, gentlemen, he said, you can all become members of parliament, you can all become uh, cabinet members, uh, some of you may become president, but you cannot become creative artists. And those sentences are emblazoned in the lobby of the State Theatre in Ankara, reminding everybody that being a creative artist, being a person who 
loves the arts is superior to being a mere politician. And it is the city of Istanbul that uh, has generated so much love in the hearts of the Turks throughout the centuries. And uh, of course, it's a nationalistic thing to love a, a city. After all, remember uh, Iranians, for instance, used to call Isfahan half the world. Esfahan and Esfajahan, they used to say. Isfahan is half the world. And of course, uh, Romans and Italians uh, think Rome is the ultimate city. Wordsworth that written <coughs> earth, there's nothing more there to show about London. And there's a, a poem and a song in Turkish which goes as Istanbul is have message in Rashkanan. What does the heart know of love if it does not love Istanbul? I'll conclude with a poem, one of the most famous modern poems in the Turkish language, written by that poet Orhan Veli, I refer to died at age 36, and I'll show you some slides of Istanbul as I read the poem to you. I am listening to Istanbul, intent, my eyes closed. At first, there is a gentle breeze, and the leaves on the trees soft this way. Out there, far away, the bells of water carriers incessantly ring. I am listening to Istanbul, intent, my eyes closed. İstanbul'u dinliyorum, gözlerim kapalı. Önce hafiften bir rüzgar esiyor. Yavaş yavaş sallanıyor yapraklar ağaçlarda. Uzaklarda, çok uzaklarda. Sucuların hiç durmayan çıngırakları. İstanbul'u dinliyorum, gözlerim kapalı. I'm listening to Istanbul. Intent, my eyes closed. Then suddenly birds fly by. Flocks of birds high up in a hue and cry while the nets are drawn in the fishing grounds and the woman's feet begin to dabble in the water. I'm listening to Istanbul, <coughs> intent, my eyes closed. İstanbul'u dinliyorum, gözlerim kapalı. Kuşlar geçiyor derken, yükseklerden sürü sürü, çığlık çığlık. Ağlar çekiliyor dalyanlarda. Bir kadının suya değiyor ayakları. İstanbul'u dinliyorum, gözlerim kapalı. I'm listening to Istanbul. Intent, my eyes closed. The grand bazaars, serene and cool. An uproar at the hub of the market. Mosque yards are teeming with pigeons. While hammers bang and clang at the docks, I'm listening to a stumble. Intent, my eyes closed. I'm listening to a stumble. Still giddy from the reveries of the past. A seaside <coughs> mansion with dingy boathouses is fast asleep. Amid the din, din, and drone of southern winds, repose. I am listening to Istanbul, intent, my eyes closed. Now, a dainty girl walks by on the sidewalk. Cuss words, tunes, and songs, fresh remarks. Something falls on the ground out of her hand. It's a rose, I guess. I am listening to Istanbul, intent, my eyes closed. A bird flutters round your skirt. I know your brow is moist with sweat and your lips are wet. A silver moon rises beyond the pine trees. I can sense it all in your heart's throbbing. I am listening to Istanbul, intent, my eyes closed. Thank you. Professor Alman for a very touching, meaningful, and educational presentation. Uh, we're delighted, and we hope to have you back. Thank you a lot for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is uh, Professor Stan Stark.
How are you, sir? Oh, my pleasure to meet you. Yes, yes. this is a real treat. Thank you. I don't often see something like this. Thank you. It's quite a crowd. It's not a lecture as such. No, it's an experience. <laughs> Multimedia. <laughs> I even sing with my terrible voice. Oh. <laughs> and I thought these young people were going to join me in a chorus while I was singing. But they, they didn't. Once we hear the beautiful voice. Oh, you know, come on. They come on. They come on. Come on. Just boil things. Yeah. So, what do you teach?